there's this other person that uh, was younger and he was marveling at the fact that there was once a O.J. Simpson reality television pilot. Uh, uh, you got juiced. Oh, oh, like he just found out? He just found out. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it turns out that'll be funny to people that don't know about that forever because he was very impressed by it. I mean, yep. Because it's really funny. Like, I mean, it, it was it was funny. Look, uh, eventually, we all discovered two girls, one cup. Yep. So take that. Both of the girls. Yeah. Juiced. And the juice. He's simply loose. Although I do feel like juice You've is, been is, juiced. Is, is it's too long a word. If, it's me, yeah. OJ. Hey, it's me. I got a knife. Hey, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Haha, -ha, man, I'm just Orinthal James Simpson. You've been, you've been juiced. Ha ha ha. That's great. Oh, it's just me, a regular pizza man. I, I got some pizza for you. Oh, no, I'm OJ. Ha. Remember me? All the things you remember about me? Being a football player and CBS broadcaster? Remember those things about me? World I, famous. I told you my favorite, <laughs> my favorite anecdote about O.J. Simpson all and like the and case more. of corporate more going, all that and more. going, going. That's a freebie. Was uh, he was a board of direct? He was on the board of directors of Swiss Army Knife. <laughs> no, <laughs> swear to God. I had a friend who was a board member and that goes. He had like like a year or two after. He's like, or a couple years later, he's like, yeah, O.J. was on the board, and we quietly removed him. And nobody ever got the wiser. Yep. <laughs> I'm like, oh jeez. You could say he now was a mul he was a, a multi tool. Yep. <laughs> I gotta, yep. I gotta, I gotta That's the definitely camera. a thing that was said <laughs> that I'm not gonna take the bait on. He does a series of short videos where it's like, uh, he's like, behold this bottle of wine he turns around he goes and now it's open now i'm not going to say whether or not i used a swiss army knife but if i did it <laughs> what a multi okay so you are going to take the bait okay <laughs> good so we have one andrew would you like to make uh oj simpson swiss army knife jokes because i've got like five and none of them are tasteful I'm good. All right, good. Then let's uh, all agree. Brian, wait, hold on. Oh, you want oh, you want back for, well, for more? I mean, I just have yeah. something in my teeth. Uh -huh, hold yeah. on. I'm not, I'm just, now it's gone. I'm not going to say whether or not I use the built-in toothpick capability of the yeah. Swiss Army knife. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But if I did, okay, that'd be awful convenient. <laughs> One more. Or it's two enough, like it was for him. <laughs> it's got dunked on. Okay. <laughs> See, Brian... This is why you're the bold man of action that I'm not. <laughs> I'm sitting here going, no way, I know I can't deliver it, won't be able to land it, won't even try. And I know. And that's why I always fail, because I never begin. I mean, the only reason Justin's not saying it is because he's literally afraid that OJ is hiding behind this set right here. <laughs> <laughs> the juice is on the loose. <laughs> hey, you guys, I have some thoughts on space elevators. <laughs> oh, no. I, 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 I rescind. I, I, I convert. Convert. Yes. I convert the one true way. The, the, the one true way of life is reusable rockets. Cut um, me into the Patreon. <laughs> I'll let the Goldmans know. <laughs> yeah, guys. Of course, remember you can use the exclamation mark S command in the chat to suggest show titles for the show we're about to record. You guys ready to do it? Yeah. Let's go. All right, Andrew. I'll count you in. In three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Mean, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello. Mr. Brian Brushwood. Hello, hello. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hello. 
Oh, well, so uh, I'm, I'm the only I, like I started an inflation joke with my two hellos and you didn't run with it. And I de- and I deflated it. Well, you fixed it. I deflated it. Yeah. Uh, Thanks, uh, Brandon. They, yeah, the, I'm, the, I'm the light brand. Let's go, Bryce. <laughs> yeah. Light Brandon. <laughs> I come to you now at the turning of the tide. <laughs> so as I was saying, uh, uh, we're still waiting for the Artemis, the SLS rocket to launch. All right, everybody, and, uh, uh, on the count of three, hold our breath. Three, two, one. <gasps> and breathe. <sighs> Let all that tension out. And then inhale. Yeah. Yeah. And breathe. <laughs> so this is a decades-long project that was supposed to be replace the space shuttle for giving NASA uh, wholly owned craft for access to space of course wholly owned meaning literally a rocket that was designed that explicitly said you have to use all of the original contractors for the space shuttle to build this because you know it'll be easier to launch and not be a problem yep. and whatnot and hydro- hydrogen is such an easy fuel to work with so well and and, uh, um, I, and I, I, nothing has happened since the space shuttle was decommissioned Absolutely well, nothing in space. Mm-hmm. There's been no advances in rocketry, so of course you want to bring the original team back. If because... anybody was building a new system, they would totally use hydrogen because it's just so easy to work it, with yeah. and problem free. Uh, I have a very emotionally complicated relationship with this story because yes, we Ryan, all... you have an emotionally complicated relationship with the world, uh, with myself. Uh, but the but in a there's part of me that admires any venture that tries to go the hard way or like yes, this is a silly Rube Goldberg experiment. But but uh, I also think it's silly that Jehovah's Witnesses won't get blood transfusions. But there have. But Brian, uh, what if they were your doctor? Well, okay, I mean, look, um, look, I love people trying crazy things. I don't love that this is being done with taxpayer dollars. I love hardworking Americans, but, yeah. but not, I not do hardworking love, pork like, like, barrels. Like, like, what if it worked? How kind of wonderfully crazy would that be that they took old spare a parts $2 and cobbled together? $2 billion per launch vehicle. How how crazy would it be for a $2 billion per use vehicle? How wonderful would that be, Brian? Uh, Just use it all the time. I'm, I, look, I, I'm not defending, uh, but, but also I think we talked about this part too. Uh, this project was started as the space shuttle was being de- decommissioned and we were about to have no proven choices so I, if you think of it and we and still I, don't th- this is this is what i go back to is uh, uh uh if you think of it as an insurance policy i like crazy as an insurance policy i but the, really I, okay so wait if you were getting an actual insurance policy you would want the craziest version of it i mean uh i because uh, it would seem to be the opposite of what you would actually want from an insurance policy. Don't give me earthquakes. Well, as, don't give me floods. I need circus accidents. I need meteorite insurance. I need panther insurance. No, you, no, no, no. You're kind of selling me on it. Yeah, yeah I no, mean, you, you guys do realize. No, no, no. That wasn't my thing. You, that's no, Bryce's no, 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 dumb no, 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 thing. No, no, no. Yo, you think. realize that that's literally what I have. No, 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 I no. Have, I, I have my I primary business, which operates very safely. I have an but, umbrella But Justin's saying something different. I have, I, have insurance, have I have business, and I have insurance from Clowns that, of America, so that when, when I perform fire eating, I've got, uh, you You just stepped into a trap, I, my No, no, but Justin's saying something different. I had to get a policy for sharks. So this is literally, I had to go find an underwriter to handle. I'm going to be swimming the great white sharks. But that like, is oh, that is very okay. sensible that's insurance. Safe. That's safe for the moment. That's that is safe. What Bryce is describing is the opposite of what I'm saying, yeah. which is yeah. that you want to cover every base you could possibly have. What I'm saying is wild insurance would be, or crazy insurance would be. Okay, well, you have regular insurance, but. Depending on where the moon is on when you get injured, then you will pay off more or less Uh-oh. than it would be well, otherwise. Uh, uh, let me be that's that's the insurance being wild and not you being safe by covering all your bases. Uh, let, this let, is let, not covering any bases. Let me restate that then. Um, I like insurance that is as far away from the primary as possible. For example, uh, there's only one internet source that we have right here. And during the pandemic, uh, that source was very intermittent. So uh, we made sure that our backup source, 
used a completely different infrastructure. It was very separate and completely independent and less reliable and lower bandwidth. And we had a third place behind it, right? So uh, in, in that regard, I would not want a copycat of SpaceX to be our backup plan. Uh, I would want something very different from SpaceX to be the backup plan. Because what if we find out what? that SpaceX doesn't work? Uh, again, yeah. th this is all you know talking in the past. I, I agree 100% that there is value to saying the government should have its own thing because if either Bezos or Musk didn't deliver those things, when we don't want to be. I guess my issue was like, there is a lot of defensiveness from like NASA, some NASA administrators and people about this program and some politicians because like, oh, no, this is what the experts decide. Like, no, it was literally decided in a Congress room by some staffers. It was not a thing where really experienced engineers came in and weighed in on it. It was literally made by a bunch of, you know, senators, you know, flacky saying, well, what can we do to protect the people we're already funding right now? Because we really want to reward them. And that's what it was. It was literally the most pork barrel. Yeah, you could no, it, it, it is it is political favors plus contractors. Uh, uh, that's your challenge. And then a bunch of very, very, very talented engineers and people that work at NASA are going to try to make this work. And so far, they have not been able to. Would it be amazing if they could? Yes. And it would be a credit to them that they were able to make this work. Uh, but they have a hell of a challenge in front of them because they were not put in a position to, to succeed. And that's that's the only thing that that I would say is that let's not think that this was a well thought out or good plan from the jump. And I wouldn't even give it the credit of being far left a field that that that, that maybe this is going to be the slower track, but it'll be more uh, uh, stable. It's not. It's less stable. It's uh, uh, less of a a a pathway that. Uh, could be a backup to anything that the private companies would do. And it's just been fiercely protected because I think a lot of the people that have made their bones selling rockets to the United States of America feel like this might be one of the last big bites at the apple. So in the situation where we are now with this hodgepodge Rube Goldberg project, very likely, quite possibly very likely never going to get off the ground. Um, much like a puppy that piddles on the carpet, uh, what is our responsibility as citizens to publicly, in the, in the public discourse, react to? Do we admonish them for having approved it at the beginning? Do we say, bad government, you shouldn't have tried? Or what, what would be the most productive thing? Those are great starts. Um, one is don't... The, the reason we had... The first space shuttle catastrophe was because of politics, was that trying to build those solid rocket boosters, the ideal thing, you would have built it on site and they would not have had those joints, those seams like they did. But because it had to be assembled in another state because of the pork barrel politics of making sure that money went to Huntsville, Alabama or whatever, they had to be put onto a railroad car and then shipped to Florida, which created a new engineering problem that shouldn't have been there to begin with, thus it blowing up. Um, the plan for the tiles a lot of these things come back to sort of bureaucratic problems and, and we have a thing that's not set up for success because it was designed to satisfy a political need and not a space need so as a citizen as i'd be like listen enough is enough stop spending money keep because it was like it went through a couple billion over budget and over budget and it's like probably like 15 billion dollars more than was planned to spend for it had we known that price tag in the beginning we would ever have done it and i think you have to have that you know that sunk cost fallacy is such a problem because you're like well, we've already put this much money into it. Okay, so are you committing to infinite money? Are you committing to another twenty billion? What what is what is a point where you go? Oh no, this is extremely inefficient system. Yeah, and 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 I totally agree that uh, with the benefit of hindsight, I, we're all on the same board that that there were clearer paths to success. Oh, no, I protested when it was started. Uh, I was a pro I was against it from the beginning. Sure, sure, but but um, but my point, my 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 question is. Um, what is the benefit or how do we maximize the attention that they're getting for this, this impending failure? I desperately want to make it as big and stinky as possible. So this is indeed one of their last gigantic big bites at the apple, unless they start acting right. Like, like they basically the, the cabal for which made money on the space program by way of shoddy contracting to NASA should be done.
And this should be the last time that we commit the kind of endless money fountain for them on the back of the idea of American space travel. Uh, uh, there are better ways for which we can go faster, explore more, and do everything that makes us feel good about being a leader in space that does not involve them. And I would like for this to be as big and painful as possible. Well, uh, you guys know better than I, but but isn't as a percentage of the total check they're writing to all of these companies, like like less than a percent, it's a rounding error? Uh, it, Compared to what? Uh, military contract, missile creation. Oh, I mean... If, uh, if like, we're comparing it to the Pentagon's budget, then then yes, like well, the our, same, our the, lives are a rounding error. That's my, I, I, I would say that. Oh, my brain. Sorry. Oh, oh, oh I, I guess I guess to restate my point, if 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 your point is to embarrass them, I I suspect the lesson they'll take away is okay. I get it. Just don't try those public things. Let's stick to those top secret things that involve missiles. I, I get. I mean. Well, I mean, it's NASA and it's a different thing and a separate sort of way that things get funded. And we could talk about the Navy's lateral ships and that debacle there and the advanced fighter problems and the billions of dollars been wasted on that that nobody cares about or wants to pay attention to, which is a problem. And our, our, the, the readiness of our Navy be, because of the same problem with the way we handle contracting. But dealing with this here, the problem is, is our goal was to have a practical way to get us back into space. And it started off bad. It started off as an impractical thing. It literally... We were said, oh, this is going to be the practical way to get to space. The real goal, the subtext was, this is a way to keep funding our existing people who support these senators, these lobbyists, et cetera. That's the real goal. That was the real goal. Of what, and it did that fantastically. That's why this program's still going on, because it was literally pork barrel. It was the most pork, porky pork barrel politics you can imagine. And that's what it did. And that's part of the problem is to say it was like, no, your goal was not to build a next generation space system. That was not your primary goal. Your primary goal is to funnel money to these people. And we've been doing it now for over a decade. I think that's part of the problem is, is we don't, we, you know, the, I think the media could do more to call what it is. As far as what we could do, we could get a podcast together and we could talk about it and rant about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so if we did have a time travel machine, what would be the same, the same budget that we ended up with now how would you allocate it? And, and none of us get the benefit of knowing that SpaceX eventually was the orbital winner and Amazon was a second place of suborbital and so on. Uh, if we didn't know anything, would, would an X prize be best or, or, well, or the, f f equally it, funding multiple moonshots? If we are going back to when this was approved, if I remember correctly, and Andrew probably knows this uh, 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 more exactly than I do, but SpaceX even then would have been enough of a reason to say, let's hold off on making this kind of bet right now. Cause they are doing enough that we should like, uh, if we wait a year or two, there might be other options that would radically shift what we would want to do. And, and a lot of this I was put into motion because of it. And I it, taking SpaceX and, and Blue Origin off the table and just saying if we said that we want to have something that the government owns because we want to pursue, we could do both routes, one pay contract for access to space, and the other route is let's build our own vehicle. I They've done a number of programs in the past to develop vehicles. There's been a none of programs filing. We've had a better, there are much better ideas that NASA has sitting in their filing cabinets for next generation systems. And the problem was it just wasn't, that wasn't the, they just wanted to fund all the existing partners. They just wanted to do that. And so that's the hard part is to say, you could say like, hey, let's revisit all the other programs we've done. Let's find one that can, we know that's going to have under a $500 million or, you know, $300 million per launch cost. Set a floor on this, a really low floor for what the cost should be. Let some people try to compete with proposals for that. And then basically say, okay, this is a thing that there's only $3 billion in this program. At the end of $3 billion, if we do not meet these metrics and have an outside group weigh that, like that's something too, is like this, the SLS, in theory, they should have appointed a group to decide if these metrics were met or not, and then say, no, this is not, this is not proceeding, we got to cut it. But the people uh, voting for the funding are the ones deciding to continue to fund it. Uh, uh, so, so if I'm hearing you correctly... Um basically create a ladder where you start at the bottom again rather than trying to go straight to the top out of spare parts from everything we've done well but, before. but again it's not it's nasa when you start i've been watching i watch these youtube channels where they get into all this sort of like deep space pro, like space program stuff and you realize how many proposals and how many things that they've been looking at over the last 
50 years for stuff. And you realize like, oh yeah, no, here was our fully reusable system we designed in 1985, but Lockheed said, you know, oh, why build reusable? You won't use it that much. Like a lot of that stuff already been invented, was already there. And not to say this should be a reusable system. It, it was just literally could have been like, we're going to contract for a next generation rocket. Uh, what were the failings of the space of the space program before? Let's avoid that. Hydrogen. Hydrogen is bad. Um, oh, uh, specifically, I, I, I hadn't read the story, but I'm ex assuming from context that yet again, the, the reason the launch was scrubbed was because everything needs to be roughly the same temperature all the way up and down. And while each piece is passing, uh, they, they, they can't seem to get all the pieces at the right temperature at the right time. Yeah, hydrogen is extremely leaky. It is literally the smallest molecule possible. And so what happens is that when you're trying to load it into a system, and part of it, it's like, oh, our rockets were great. Yeah, but it's all the other systems that you have to build from the ground up because the connecting hoses, all these other things, these quick disconnects, a lot of these little details, it's really in the details. And they're like, well, we got these. Another thing too that's not paid attention, those solid rocket boosters, they have an expiration date, right? They're already past the expiration date. They keep recertifying it. There's also the batteries in the launch abort system. That's past the expiration date originally. And they keep recertifying that to say, because this has been on the pad much longer than it is. So that's kind of the crazy thing is that like, Dave, like these parts, they've already were like already have extended past the point at which they said, no, this is the limit where you should keep it. And they're like, well, you know, we think it's good condition. We can keep going. Yeah. There's a the, lot if, of scary. If this is a brewing, a brewing extreme disaster, like unfolding in the moment, then, then I think you've tugged me closer to your side where uh, is the solution to pull the plug on it, to, to demand this, this, this isn't working, it's not going anywhere? Well, it, remember, it, it will never be cheaper than like $2 billion per launch. It will never, the cost of this will never go down. Like shuttle actually got more expensive. It'll never be cheaper than $2 billion. So even in a success scenario, we have a launch vehicle that's basically like almost the entire budget of human space flight every time you want to launch it, um, which that sounds bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's certainly not pricey. Or, I guess you. I if, would not if like. If you combine that. syllables, you can make anything sound bad. Damn, In, <laughs> uh, inflation's <laughs> infecting everywhere. <laughs> uh, uh, Andrew, yeah. in your opinion, does Artemis ever launch? Yes, it, it, it's it's we've we've seen that there is no no limit to how much money people will sink into it. And now that people are paying attention to it, people don't really care. They'll hear like dot, 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 cost a lot. Anyhow, uh, it'll launch. It'll launch, and I think we'll probably get a human mission out of it. What that cost will be, what the time frame will be, I hope this launch, I hope they're able to launch it in the next window, they're able to do it. I hope it's successful. I hope the telemetry and all that tells there's no, no problems. Uh, I do worry about astronauts going on it. Because of the capacity for it to it just have hy something horrifying. Hydrogen, there full were, stop, yeah. There were 100 Falcon 9 launches before a human ever went on board a Falcon 9. 100. Yeah. And it was But it's only gotten more difficult. I see, but it's only gotten more difficult to go to space, Andrew, is the thing. It's true that. This, uh, this shuttle, it was like it's the 30th mission. It's getting choppy up there. Uh, it's hey, choppy up there. May, may, maybe a lot right, of chop. Right now is a good Big chop. refresher. Uh, I, I, I don't expect you to remember all of this, Andrew, but I suspect you remember it better than me. So Artemis is uh, hydrogen-fueled. Uh, what is, what is, uh, uh, do the SpaceX rockets run on? Because I, I, I think they're switching fuels for— Kerosene. Propane. The original—the uh, Falcon 9 is kerosene. And then the the starship is is methane. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, kerosene is is straight up uh, jet fuels. Uh, uh, same thing that runs on a seven thirty seven. Uh, and then uh, uh, methane was uh, an interesting choice. That's part of why uh, the methane reacting with the copper from the engine is why you see that flash of green when you see test firings on on uh, the the Falcon. <laughs> uh, well, uh, hopefully not. That is what they call an engine-rich mixture, where it literally is eating the engine. <laughs> just a little bit, just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, what about uh, Blue Origin? Uh, the the Blue Origin, the the next generation rocket, they're going to be the 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 new Glenn is going to be a is going to be uh, methane as well. And then, um, but speaking of Blue Origin, I don't know if you saw them in the news. I, I did not. Well, uh, Blue Origin had a little bit of mishap with their new shepherd. Oh, no. 
So the new shepherd, uh, this was not with people. This was just, this was flying, um, a, uh, some equipment. Actually, I have a friend that had a, an experiment on board there. Um, so, uh, that, uh, had a little bit of a problem. Now the escape capsule, the part that the, the payload was in did manage to safely get away. And everybody's like, oh, if you'd been on board, there'd be safe. And they're like, oh, wow. Yeah. This looked like it pulled nine G's. You might've blacked out, but you'd be probably good. Oh, you yeah, know, I, I think uh, this we, is what we, we talked about last week. We looked at the video, but it wasn't clear to us. Uh, why? And, we, we and, and I don't why. think the details had emerged yet, whether or not, um, uh, like, what happened when. Uh, uh, we, we did our, our best analysis of the Zapruder film, but I, but didn't have much. What, what have we learned yeah. over the last week? Oh, I don't know that. Yeah, I'm sorry I wasn't here last week. Um, uh, and good on you guys for covering it. Oh, I don't. Where we were last right? week was that we, we knew that it happened. We knew that it looked like they had fired off the the escape uh evacuation system but we it, it had happened so recently we didn't have a reason for why the anomaly happened or or uh, whether or, or any not explanation for even the, the the main stage had exploded or whether or not you know just the the top capsule just basically what the hell happened we, we we just knew that there was some crazy stuff that looked awesome yeah the telemetry they looked at uh it appeared that it like went into a tumble so it may not have been a full explosion. There may, may have been some sort of engine out or some other kind of issue. And so um, basically there could have been anything anomalous. All of a sudden that escape castle is like, hey, I'm out of here. And So there's going to be a big investigation for it. By the way, that is a liquid hydrogen and uh, oxygen uh, propellant for that. So the BE-4, which is the next generation rocket they're building, which is going to power the Vulcan, that'll be, that'll be uh, uh, BE-4, I believe is methane. So, um, yeah, and it, the, the challenge is that uh, the, if you look at the launch history of the New Shepard, um, this was launch number 23, and the last launch, and this, this was a different vehicle than what they had people on, but the last launch had people on it. Wow. Uh, uh, and, and thankfully, the, the capsule itself was okay, right? It was just whatever yeah. happened with the booster. Uh, their, yeah, the boost. Uh, their official update here says booster failure on today's uncrewed flight escape system performed as designed. During today's flight, the capsule escape system successfully separated the capsule from the booster. The booster impacted the ground. There are no reported injuries. All personnel accounted for. So, so yeah. So it sounds like there was a some sort of mechanical. Well, or that was last fail. week. That was the twelfth. So they don't have any update on other than literally says right front fell off um <laughs> and space is hard it's really hard yeah. and for but for blue origin the problem is like literally when you're you've been showing advertisements of hey take our ride into space take our ride into space whoopsie daisy this one blew up but hey you would be fine you you would be fine you would be and have a little thrill ride uh and it was a different booster than the one we used for the people and it's like oh do you have boosters that you plan to blow up right so and and uh, you know, just kind of looking around, their Twitter is quiet the past week. It's it is a little it is a little strange that we uh, still don't have an answer. We got we got nothing. We're still kind of where we were last week. <laughs> I guess I guess you can't tweet through it. I guess not, or maybe they know not to. Yeah, that's the that's They're the like, hey, what's going on in the NFL, guys? <laughs> this football is these crazy. This football is launching off. <laughs> it's lifting off. What? We're lifting the. You launch can launch off into success, right. uh, both spiritually and financially, if you head <laughs> to Patreon.com/slash/WeirdThings. There, you will experience a Zen for which only the true ancients can describe. You will get the After Things podcast earlier. You will get access to our subscriber-only Discord channel, and you will get updates directly to your inbox, as well as an all-in-one RSS with no login. You heard me right. What? No login at all? No, you don't need any usernames or passwords. Ugh. You just put it into the podcatcher that you're listening to this on right now. Set it and forget it. It's just that simple. Patreon.com uh, yeah, slash We weird just things. trademarked that. We made that phrase up. We own it. Anyone who says otherwise can contact our attorney, Jennifer Walters. That's it. Check it out. Patreon.com slash weird things. Uh, Rocket Lab had a successful mission. Their 30th mission delivered a Japanese radar satellite into orbit. Uh, Rocket Lab is the kind of the more quieter New Zealand-US company. The Peter Beck's the founder of that. And they're 
they there's a lot of space companies out there, but in some of them, there's been kind of a reckoning where funding's been falling through for several of them. And some people have trouble getting to space, but Rocket Lab seems pretty solid. You know, they seem to be doing a pretty good job. Well, and, was you know, it, hats was off it, to anyone. Was it Rocket Lab or somebody else who got in trouble or got fussed at for shooting a disco ball into space? I think that may have been Rocket Lab. Okay, yeah. I, I, I'm uh, pretty sure. Uh, uh, let let me, yes. uh, Andrew, I know you watch this space very closely, uh, but obviously in Silicon Valley, with the slowdown in the economy, there's been a lot of, uh, of VC money that has tightened up and that has made for a lot of cuts at uh, companies that were otherwise growing at a fairly exponential rate. Is that the same for the space companies? Yeah, you've had a number of companies that were trying, that wanted to show results and then trying to go do another raise has been hard because you've had a couple, we've covered some of the mishaps have that have just had just problem after problem after problem and finding money has been harder for them because there are other players. And if you're gonna, do you wanna keep investing? And if, if in, in, it might just be bad luck, it might say something about the engineering culture of a company if it just consistently has a problem. And not to say the engineers are bad, but just for management or something that there might be pushing too much, that's the hard part. And so, Yes, it's yeah. been it's, it's, it, been, it's, been, it's a, been tough sledding to continue to kind of uh, uh, stay in this game because this is not a a penny ante industry, right? Like like you need to be in big uh, 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 from 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 the very beginning with this stuff. Yeah, you had like Maston Space Systems, which was bidding on some. I think they bid on like like the lunar lander or whatever and whatnot. Um, and then they had some trouble and they just basically, uh, got acquired by Astrophic. Mm. And so, um, you know, there's been and some called it called Asian. Oh, wow. That would be interesting if, if, you know, if, if that is part of it is uh, wondering which companies are worthwhile to be acquired by, by larger players in an industry for which larger players are still pretty new. Yeah. yeah. Could, could you, could, could there be big consolidation between a, a SpaceX and a Blue Origin, is that no. too? Is that too big? I, I, I think. I think. Yeah. That. 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 Now. Now you're dealing with egos of well, <laughs> what? Well, just to... What would? What would? What would SpaceX get out of that? Yeah. Other than a cluster F, because you can hire. But if you say if SpaceX works really well, you know, if you say we need more engineers, that onboarding uh, and trying to bring people to speed well, is so hard. Well, okay, then flip it. Then could Blue Origin buy SpaceX? What could they cons- could that consolidation could the, happen? Could the second richest man in the world buy the richest man in the world's company? In theory, uh, but it would be I, I again mean, it's the worth point thinking is like, about. <laughs> it's 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 they're two very different. Uh, it, there's 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 the product, there's the infrastructure, there's the culture, there's all these other things that go on there, and you'll get like and consider consistently a, a consolidation would work if let's say. Let's say SpaceX just made Starlink, the satellites, mm-hmm. and then Blue Origin says, oh, we want to buy your satellite division and have you make satellites. That's easy because it's a separate building. It's a separate thing. It's just literally now your direct report is here. You handle the accounting. But okay. if you're like, okay, which engine do we have? Do we do the BE-4 or do we do the Raptor? Which one is our priority? And you say, so I would say. Unlikely oh, at that okay. at that level, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, un- unlikely for those companies for all the reasons that were were, were enumerated but there. But to I would... Bryce's point, though, to to Blue Origin coming along to say Rocket Lab, and yes. Jeff Bezos saying, "I really dig what you guys are doing because it's a much smaller company." And say because like within the rumor is within Blue Origin, Bezos was so frustrated with the development that he created a separate team and a separate division to develop in parallel their own rocket system. Which is just just to, effed up. just to try to shake up his his main product line is to have somebody else go, you know, with with their own stuff. Yeah, build like a separate, which is kind of a warrant. Like if you're like, if I don't trust these people to deliver it, and I'm going to go fund a bunch of money to go build a separate thing that we're trying to compete with ourselves. Yeah, yeah. that seems a little odd, a little strange. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, you, you mentioned Starlink, and it uh, it jogged my mind. I I don't know that we've discussed it yet. Uh, a competitor for Starlink, this gigantic, like a uh, half a football field size satellite for uh, uh, cellular transmissions. Uh, d- did you see the story, uh, Andrew? Yeah, I saw the 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 upper uh, the, the outrage over the yeah rather. Uh, yeah, huge. Universe Today covered it in detail. Fast Company has it, but it's uh, 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 the tweet 
was talking about uh, hashtag Blue Walker 3 is this gigantic array of, of highly <laughs> reflective stuff, is which, which is what you need for a low Earth orbit uh, cell phone uh, station that could, and this is, this is the gotcha quote, outshine all the stars and the moon at times, which uh, uh, I don't know how, in a world where we've got telescopes uh, that, that, that have unfettered access to all the stars in the sky, I don't know how scary that threat sounds to me these days. Well, we're not astronomers. I mean, I'm not. I don't know. I, I, I'm hesitant to dismiss, you know, other people who have a different way of looking at it. You know. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, I, I just. Yeah, I don't. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Bryce, is that you laughing at how gigantic this thing is? No, at the the the, the comedy being recorded right now on the like, oh, I, like, like I'm trying to like I'm I personally am at peace with the idea that this thing might, you know, rotate and then just suddenly at 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 two o'clock in the morning. There's just a, a light as though a street lamp turned on over uh, all of these backwoods and then it goes away. And in exchange, there's incredible cell phone reception happening for, you know, more telecommunications all over the world. Uh, uh, I am okay with that trade because I already get assuming that that's the give back on the trade. Well, which is a thing that we do not know. Uh, correct. But uh, and I'll tell you this much: um, uh, I derive a lot of joy every time I catch the ISS going overhead. You know, I have a little app that lets me know, and if 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 the really far away stuff is stuff I download from the internet and in exchange, I get to see close up stuff that looks cool and shows up at certain times, then that's a pretty special backyard uh, uh, looking at the sky moment for me either way. But, but then again, I haven't invested millions of dollars. Tell me about your pending, tell me about your pending grab grant applications for observing <laughs> I, I, objects near. And, correct. Correct. Hey, but, Brian. Yes. I know. You know who else really love big projects like this? I just sent the link to Bryce. I'll tell you who else loves stuff like this. Uh, uh, I, 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 uh, I, I, oh, I remember reading in, uh, some, some young adult or young teenager magazine about a, there was going to be a celebration of some anniversary in France and they were going to inflate this giant ring of balloons that was going to be as bright as the full moon for a year. And everyone was like, how about no? Ah, <laughs> oh, the French. <laughs> <laughs> Who's excited? Oh, doggone it. <laughs> what's, what's the title there? What's the title on this YouTube video? Uh, it says, Andrew Heaton is a jerk. Uh, Andrew yeah. Heaton. Heaton. Oh, sorry. Jesus. <laughs> sorry. Wow. I, was, I saw the word Nazi, and I thought instantly of Andrew of Heaton. Andrew Heaton. <laughs> no, it is the Nazi sun gun using the sun to melt armies. So I guess this is a plan by old H-bomb. There was apparently, I mean, uh, how do you how do you even address the 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 crazy schemes that came out of the Nazis? Look, man, I had a, just... I had a magnifying glass. I, there were some ants. Uh, I, I ain't gonna, you know, I I understand. This is from the channel Escape Velocity. So they did a YouTube video talking about there was a plan. The Nazis had an idea for building a giant space mirror to basically, you know, melt people from orbit. There are a lot of technical problems there, and the amount of the amount of uh, amount of energy it would take to put that into orbit, you might as well just use those rockets to, you know, bomb blow people. up. But, yeah. Hey, stand yeah, yeah. still. No. <laughs> yeah. No. It was like I'm they're moving. like, hey, let's build a thousand. Like the Russians got this plan. Like first we build a thousand rockets. Dot 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 dot. And then like, wait, why don't we just put bombs on the rockets? <laughs> oh. Oh yeah. Okay. Cool. So. Uh, there's that. Um, I want to change topic completely. I want to show you some new tech. I hadn't seen this before. I wanted to get your take on it. Have you all heard of the Brailleon? It is a an immersive virtual monitor. I have not heard of the Brailleon. Go on. I think I have, but uh, yeah, go on. B-R-E-L-Y-O-N, an MIT spinoff between Lockheed Martin and E14, an MIT-affiliated fund. 
And so what they've built is this sort of deep field display. So imagine something that sits on top of your desk and then in front of you, it looks like kind of a hooded monitor that's much smaller, but by apparently looking through it, it gives you what appears to be a humongous field of view. So you're kind of looking in it like a, like a, like a, like a football referee who is looking into the, the, uh, a review Instant box replay. or whatever. Yeah. You'd be, you'd be sitting here and this thing would be like here, but it would all of a sudden I mean, do this with your hands, do this right now. And so you're okay, so, so for, for, for listeners, uh, we are, we are kind of, yeah, we are putting uh, L's in, in either side of our face, framing it as if we are about to Vogue or surrender about like an 18, about 18 inches apart, you know, okay. about this. So imagine everything you see through that, like the field of view, how big your monitor, look how much bigger, how much more field of view you have through there. Uh, a lot. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So that's what it does is basically it uses some like an, a mirror, a curved mirror and some special optics or whatever to basically allow you to look at a display that's maybe 18 inches across. But to your mind, you're looking at something through there that's much, much, much bigger. So instead oh, of Jesus. feeling like it's eight inches in front of your nose, it appears to be several feet away and humongous. So uh, how, how close to real and commercial is this? Uh, I mean, they're taking... There's a pre-order button. Yeah, it looks like there's pre-orders. You want to get in on that, Brian? Deceptive. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to wait for my, uh, uh, whatever that little... What's the, what, 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 what's the cost, Bryce, if we were going to click on it to, to pre-order? How much, uh, uh, oh, how much is, is a... Brian going to... He's committing fully to whatever the price is <laughs> right now. He's going to pre-order it on the... On the show. Uh, this so is more they, of a, an email list. An email harvesting. Yeah. Brian, it's free. I mean, I might as well just get a, get a circle of them so, so it's full 360. You've had, you've had no recent problems with spam. You should, you <laughs> should put your email uh, in another place. <laughs> uh, um, uh, I'm looking at a number that says maybe four, five to $7,000. Cough it up, uh, cheapskate. Well... Come on, so you think skin about Flint. This. Why don't, why don't me, you get in me, there? Get some skin in the game. Your skin is made of money. <laughs> okay, consumer Price. consumer models will be closer to fifteen hundred dollars. Okay. So, but let's start at the pro in there. Let's just you just let's not throw it out just yet. You're looking at a virtual hundred and twenty inch display. Hundred and twenty inches, Brian. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, I if mean, you could live hundred and twenty years, you'd be very happy. Imagine that in inches. I mean, a lot of monitors <laughs> look big if you put your face real close to them yeah. and put a bed sheet over. Uh -huh. this, this, yeah. I mean, uh -huh. what's what's the resolution on this, Bryce? What's the rezo? Let's uh, get the res. Resonant. That's a great question. That's a very resonant question. Yeah, because what's the res. I know that they do have uh, sixty and a hundred uh, uh, hundred forty four hertz versions. <laughs> Man, that's a lot of hertz, dude. Uh, I, We're hurts in it. Uh, the prototype is a 4K LG LCD screen. Uh, 4K with a 24 by 9 aspect ratio, so very wide. By nine. I mean, I like I like what, what I'm hearing. All right, let's go. How, How much? Uh, five thousand. Uh, uh, five no, to ten. He said, he said fifteen hundred. No, uh, that was for the consumer basic consumer version. Consumer, will be but you want maybe. the pro. You want you really want what's, to go pro. What's the trick to this tech? Andrew, is is it? Um... it, it you have well, to sit very close to it. display. So basically, the idea is that it's <laughs> using this. this uh, it's Sorry. using like this curved mirror to like basically create the illusion that it, you're not. It's not look at a foot in front of your face. That it's like three feet away and much bigger. So that's the the, the trick of it is. It's not like hey, we're going to put a monitor in front of your face like a VR helmet and tell you ah, isn't this huge? We're going to put a monitor, you know, a foot or so away from you, but you're going to look through it and feel like you're looking through it to the wall beyond, and it's much larger. Have, have you ever um, uh, looked at one of those uh, makeup monitors that, uh, or monitors, uh, mirrors that is uh, curved, mm -hmm. and, and you get this kind of unreal, it, it, you know, it's meant to uh, uh, magnify everything, but you maintain stereoscopic uh, vision. So it, it, it uh, I, I, I would imagine it's a similar kind of thing to that. I can stare at those for hours. I'll tell you what, this hype video they have, uh, uh, their founders are very mysteriously lit. Looks it makes like sense to try to do this like virtual large display idea. It makes a ton of sense, right? That's, that's the hey, first Justin. thing all the VR things do is like, hey, watch Hulu in a big theater. Yeah. 
Back up, back up to the the Justin. Do I, is it is it the founder that looks like me, or is it just another guy who's hosting it? Uh, let's see. We're watching let's the see. Brelion Ultra Reality Display coming to CES. Oh, I'll Why bet you this is probably going to be one of the things they talk about a lot at CES. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. that guy did look well, a he's, uh, Yeah, so Indian this time. So add, the, uh, that, add that to the list of people people I look like. Or Mac Heshman. The, uh, the value would seem to me, in a world where you can buy a 120-inch, 170 hertz, 4K display, uh, the value of this would be if you, uh, yeah, I don't know, had a bunch of cubicles in an office space, everybody gets that big, rich display without taking up all that real estate, and they get a relatively private uh, display as well. Mm. Oh, sorry, Egyptian, not Indian. Apologies to the founder of Braylon. Yeah. I, the- Have you watched Yellowstone yet, Justin? No, but there's apparently what? There's an uh, American, a Native American that looks like me. It's just a cowboy. Did anybody watch Yellowstone? Not yet. No, not yet. No. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. yeah you, Another you, you one. You found your acting double. I Yeah. I just, you know, I look like a lot of ethnicities. <laughs> it's, it's like a straight up white dude. It's just oh, like, is it? You know. Okay. Oh, good. White too. Yeah. Add that to the list. <laughs> I mean, this is, is that important to you? So Why about, is important to you? about this monitor, Bryce. Yeah. The, so one uh, of the things what, is like you you can't you can't use it far away. You have to be up close to it because otherwise, you know, you do but that. But most monitors, test. yeah. But but the, the, it, it is a standard way that we interact with monitors, right? I guess so. But then at that point, like like if I want a big display, I would want it to enlarge details so that I could see something at a glance if i'm at an office setting yeah having bigger text and good readability is important but i wouldn't want a hundred to pretend there's a hundred inch screen right here i I think i think the idea is and what they're betting and i guess we're all going to find out in a few months when ces or i guess no no if it was ces 2020 yeah this uh, was that 20 this was all right all right then never mind um then yeah uh, i guess it 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 probably uh, came and went but I, i think what they're hoping is the idea is that you are immersed in it and you feel really, really happy that you were looking at this screen to the point where you want to make it your primary situation, that it's not yeah. just a gimmick. It is immersive on a level that you are, are happy about. <clears throat> the, the big thing for me is sometimes you see really cool image tech and you realize, oh yeah, you can't move your head. Like you've got to be yeah. fixed there. And that's going to be like kind of the deal breaker on that. And by the way, I just sent you a link to look at Ryan Bingham's website. And I need you guys to judge this. All right. Tell me if I'm being. That's a bearded white guy. I mean, on a long enough timeline, all of us look like Justin Robert. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's think? a character. Should I? Yeah. Wait, hold on. Let me put on I think my it's... glasses. Hey, Bryce, you got any pics? Look at that. Uh, yeah, uh, done. He's got a stronger done. jaw. That's the problem with me. I have a very weak jaw. Yeah, that's your problem is your jaw is... That's your he problem. might have a weak jaw, too. He has a bigger beard, though. Yeah. Anyway, that's the guy. I've I got a pick. What's your pick, pick, Bryce? Are we doing picks? Let's pick it up. Uh, I got a, uh, a pick, uh, uh, a, a video game uh, pick. I, I played this uh, last week or so. I finished this relatively quickly. It's out now on uh, a bunch of different platforms. Uh, it's called Toem, uh, T O E M, and it's uh, just a it's just a sweet little game where it, you go around and you take photos and you uh, solve people's problems and you find things to take photos and you can take selfies and uh, it's very cute. It's a lot like Hidden Folks. I find it is a lot like Hidden Folks, especially visually, uh, because it's presented in black and white or monochrome, mm-hmm. um, and uh, it is not very long. I think I got about a hundred percent in five hours, five six hours. Uh, very, very fun. Music's great, very charming, uh, and it's free on uh, PlayStation Plus right now. So, uh, if you're a PlayStation person, you can get it free there. But uh, is it uh, oh. PlayStation only, or is there a Steam version? Or? No, we got the Steam one here. Uh, it's on PC, and I think it's on the other consoles as well. But uh, yeah, Tom, very cute. It's like a, it's it's a it's a cheaper priced game uh com- commiserate with the size of the game so cool tell him i got a pick you got a pick yeah 
Pick it up. I can't believe that this show still holds my interest because I would not have thought that it would continue to hold my interest. Which is weird because we've been your friends for so long. Yeah. No, I don't Brian, understand. Not I know. this show. I, I would... <sighs> Another show <laughs> well, that's on okay. Netflix, Cobra Kai. Hey, look, uh, here's the thing about Cobra Kai. Uh, you watch these episodes, and boy, do you know you're going to get a karate fight <laughs> every episode. <laughs> And and it's it's become endearing to figure out like how they're gonna get these people to have a karate fight every episode, and I I really like it. And that I I was getting a little wobbly on it in in the previous seasons because I feel like felt like they were leaning a little bit too much on Daniel Larusso. They were getting a little bit away from from a, a, a too much a Kai, Tony not enough Cobra. Well, I mean, you no, know, it was all Miyagi stuff. And it's like, look, it's not called the Miyagi Chronicles. It's not called the, you got a bunch of movies, Karate Kid. Uh, it's it's Cobra Kai's time. Uh, but but I, I think they did a, a really, really good job. Uh, I don't know how many more seasons they're going to be able to squeeze out of this thing, but what, what is, I'm, I'm in. I love it. I, I love this season. It's new. Go watch it. What is the lowest stakes karate fight you've seen in the history of this show? They went, they went to dream karate fight. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, when, when one character was trying to confront, uh, confront themselves, they had a, a dream karate fight where they were fighting themselves. Uh, that was probably the first time where it's like, oh, geez, we got to figure a karate fight in here. Maybe, maybe we can exploit this dramatic tension. Uh, but there was also a karate fight uh, uh, with a bunch of there, there's a moment early in this season where a character gets scammed by like some really, really low level scam artists. Uh, and then eventually you're like, oh, wow, that's kind of weird that they just had him get ripped off by these scam artists. And then you realize by the end of the episode where it's like, oh, it's to set up the karate fight. OK, good, good, good. Now, <laughs> now these uh, suspiciously well-built scam artists are going to get into a karate fight. <laughs> They're jumping off of speakers to the top of the white van. Yeah, it, it, it is. It is uh, effectively at that level. But I mean, look, the, the, the point of the show is that it's it's lighthearted and uh, uh I mean, if if half of the Karate Kid movies that they are using the lore as if it's the Bible to build these like twelve episode seasons were as good or well written as Cobra Kai, then Karate Kid would have been even bigger. I, I, I love like I haven't seen this season, but like when I liked to get how unreasonably excited I was that the bad boy of karate would be coming back. You know that that like. You know, and the idea that is Hillary Swank going to be in there? There is something yes. funny about like, if you're going to mine nostalgia, friggin' dig deep, go for it, go for it. You know, that's why Maverick was amazing because like the best description I heard was Maverick amount. Um, imagine Top Gun was a better, and Top Gun was a great film, but imagine that it was this masterpiece. Yes, and said, well, how do we follow it up? We need to respect the gravitas of. Iceman, you yes. know, and they did, and it was amazing, and I cried, and so the Karate Kid, it's sort of like, and living in the valley, you do sometimes look at signs and stuff, and you're like, man, this All Valley Karate Tournament, it is everything. Uh, I I will say that I mean, especially now that we are we are in the in in the point of this series that is taking its cues from the other Karate Kid movies. We're at the point where the Karate Kid movies were not great, right? We are at the point where these characters yeah. were fairly thinly written, and and the point was that that all these teenagers were going to go see another film. Uh, they take it deadly serious, and not only is the bad boy of karate Mike Barnes in uh, 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 this season, but there are some other uh, some other cameos in uh, uh, the, the from from the same movie. Can I tell you the biggest regret of my life now? What's that? Uh, go back to the 1990s and a magician named Andrew Maine, who, when he wasn't working on cruise ships to make money, would work as an extra mm -hmm. and uh, got a call one day from a casting agent wanting to know if I could come down because they needed to know how tough I could look because they needed some <laughs> tough guys for the Hillary Swank Karate Kid oh, movie. Man. The next Karate Kid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. And I'm like, nah, I'm good. Doesn't feel like my thing. That could have been. I could have been, you know, you know, angry, you know, youth number four or something. I, I do wonder 
how they're going to figure it. Because that's it's we're, we're, we're at the end of the other Karate Kid movies. At, at a certain point, it's only the next Karate Kid that they're going to be able to, to take from. Well, and, Justin, there was a TV series cartoon. There was. And I guess they're also, I mean, Jaden Smith no. and Jackie Chan would be the only other, uh, the only other uh, yeah. uh, those stuff would be, past those that. Would, oh, man, those would be gets, too. Those would be doable gets. That's like in- one very doable, one very doable. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say um, the other one, uh, but yeah. But there we go. Anyway, Cobra Kai, it's fun. It's just a fun, good show that I like to watch. Nice. Uh, hey, so I read a, a book, um, Life's Work by David Milch. Uh, it's his life's memoir. And it begins, uh, uh, David Milch, who, of course, wrote for Hill Street Blues, co-created NYPD Blue, created Deadwood, uh, did a number of incredible projects. It begins with him. Something will take off for him initially someday. uh, It begins with him explaining that this is a collaborative effort, uh, and he gives his current brain plaque levels because he has Alzheimer's. And he explains that with help from his wife, his team, and his notes and all that stuff. All of this is his words, uh, and he has periods of lucidity, but he begins with just a, just a heartbreaking tale of, of, of his upbringing and being addicted to not just heroin, but the process of heroin and how it led him to write and uh, becoming a teacher, becoming a fixture of Hollywood, um, how he got sober, how he uh, uh, had opportunities to create Deadwood, the unfairness of, of you know, how, how Deadwood ended so abruptly and the shame he felt, uh, and uh, then ultimately his diagnosis of dementia and then Alzheimer's. And uh, when the Deadwood movie came out, three it was three years after his diagnosis. So everybody on set knew, but it wasn't... Uh, uh, totally, I think they announced like when they announced the movie, his diagnosis. And um, uh, I went back and watched the beginning of the movie, and he talks about this moment that Calamity Jane is uh, 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 drunk walking to uh, uh, Wild Bill's grave, uh, and she begins by saying, "You know, you know, here, ten years gone." And it's like when she, when the actress said that, there was this hitch. And all it was as though a spell was cast. And for one brief moment, there was lucidity and time travel. And all of these actors were brought back for something truly special. Uh, it's, 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 it, 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 it's, it's a painful book about creation and the creative process. It's a revealing book. It's honest. Uh, I, uh, I, 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 I enjoyed how unpleasant it was. Uh, it's, it's quite good as you would expect anything from David Milch to be. Yeah. Wow. Wow. It is so hard when you think about somebody says a guy as accomplished as him, who, what he's done is amazing, how he's changed TV. And he says, Oh, the, the, he felt shame when Deadwood got canceled, which is like the kind of the normal course of things. And the rest of us are like, uh, I'll talk about this in my pick, but yeah. Um, uh, 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 real quick about that. There was uh, an uh, article that I read that came out this week talking about specifically like the day that it got canceled. So I don't know how much, I guess maybe parts of this were revealed in his memoir. And so now there's another writer who had done reporting for another book that wrote about it. But uh, apparently it was a fight over whether or not he was upset that HBO was pitching an eight episode season and because he wanted 12 he wanted each one he wanted 12 yeah. and then he was like well screw it we won't do it i'll just do john from cincinnati right and uh uh <sighs> and then was like uh uh oh wait uh i guess they were serious <laughs> I, I thought they would just tell me you could have 12 uh and, and and apparently the hbo execs uh that are interviewed in this article are like we would have given him 12. Like, we don't know why he wanted to, like, a uh, 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 high road us, but that also sounds like an, ex- an exec who doesn't want to be credited as well, the guy I mean, who killed I mean, Deadwood. That, that's, that's a theme throughout the book is his addiction to gambling, you know, yeah. to, to, to the ponies. Um, mm. You know, uh, he talks about uh, how uh, the, the day of reckoning when his financial advisors uh, sat down his wife and said, your husband has gambled away $25 million, you are $17 million in debt, you owe the IRS $5 million. 
and uh, they worked on a payment plan because of his addiction. He was put on a forty dollar a week allowance, <laughs> and uh, 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 you know, by the time that became public, his family, you know, that had been like three years in the past, and his family had reckoned with it. It's it's very honest and authentic. Um, uh, what I did know is that Deadwood started off as uh, he wanted to write about the story of uh, Paul, uh, uh, somebody who uh, was brought to Christianity and uh, uh, went to uh, uh, the, the Pharisees or the Sadducees or whatever and said, hey, uh, this, is a, this is a good gig. You don't even have to get circumcised. And they were like, go somewhere else. And so he, would go, uh, he wanted to set it in Rome yep. and, and, and have him basically just you know, get his balls busted a whole bunch. And uh, HBO says, we love it. Unfortunately, we're running we're, a show yeah, yeah, yeah. called we're, we're, Rome. Yeah, we are currently working with the BBC on right. this show called Rome. And, and, and quite literally, David Milt said, how can I tell the same story? What else do we worship? What else do we worship? Gold. We worship gold. <laughs> and uh, uh, the Old West was a nasty place. And then he read everything he could. And it's shocking how little he changed uh, in the story of Deadwood, uh, it sounds like, yeah. like, like apparently Bullock and, um, uh, Swear uh, uh, no, 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 uh, Bullock and, uh, Wild Bill oh. arrived historically three days apart, but he took the liberty of having them arrive at the same time. Uh, yeah. it's like, like the fact that it was that close to reality. Uh, uh, and also he says almost everything is written in iambic pentameter and he, he, you know, pontificates on why that is. It's it's amazing. And that's the other thing is that uh, as somebody who was a huge fan of Deadwood as it was airing, is that there is a gigantic climactic end to that chapter in real life of Deadwood that ends in a gigantic cinematic fire. And uh, uh, you kind of always, as a fan, were like, okay, we're building, <laughs> we're building, we're building. And then it's John from Cincinnati. Uh, had a great theme you song. I just sent uh, Bryce the link to where most of the shooting for Deadwood took place, which is like, I don't know, six miles from me. Or he, seven uh, miles. He, he spends he spends like half a chapter just singing the praises and, and talking about how alive a space it is and, and how immersive the experience was and how he would just walk around because his style of writing was quite literally to show up on set and then lay down on a couch and just talk and have people write stuff down. Uh, yeah, it's a. Yeah, it was. I believe at the time that they were shooting the largest immersive set that had been created in 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 the world, and, and they just left it up, which was the other reason why it was like so insane that they, that he get into a fight over four episodes with HBO because they're like, like, all right, there's a set here, like that's gigantic and dressed only for Deadwood, cannot be used. I mean, you could you could redress it, which I'm sure that they have, but like. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, the Melody Ranch. What a what an epic, epic yeah, place. There is in the book a fair bit of. I heard this story about me. I don't remember that, <laughs> but maybe it's possible. Tales, tales of an addict. Yeah, and and, and yeah, I, I'm looking forward to listening to it. All right, my turn. Yes, yep. I. So, um, first, shameless plug. I do have a new book out called The Final Equinox. Hey. On the Theo Craig, Jessica Blackwood book, and it involves a signal from the edge of outer space and talks about UAPs and other stuff and perhaps a slightly skeptical take, just saying. And it is uh, very happy to put this out and I'm in the middle of working on a new book. And we talk about like different levels and you look at where uh, uh, my wife was talking about something about like there was a, a clip that was like uh, of somebody who was in the Indian film industry who was the daughter of somebody famous said that like I had to get my start by working as like, you know, an assistant to this director or this. And I didn't get my choice of this. And somebody who worked their way up from nothing said um, their dream begins where ours ends. And, you know, the, the expression meaning that this person says I had to start off because I well, I started off as an assistant to a famous director and somebody else is like. You get to be an assistant to a famous director. You know, I work at Arby's. You know, well, that's kind of awesome. But anyhow, that that's the thing is often yeah. there's always this other level. And so, you know, I've got a book coming out and I've got to write a new book. And the thing that you don't want to become is complacent. You don't want to sit there and go, oh, I've got this. I'm good. I can just keep putting these things out. I always want to improve my craft. And I'm very lucky. I get to do two books a year. I'm, you know, in a 
great place, Wall Street Journal bestsellers, et cetera. Like this book's already at like 400 reviews and it's been out a week. That's awesome. But there's always another level. And so I found myself watching a masterclass last week from uh, David Baldacci, who is an exceptionally, you know, highly talented writer and just a huge high seller. And so like, that's the thing. As I'd be like, oh, what's it feel like? And we get this people like, oh, what's it feel like to make it? It's like, there's always another level. And yeah. so for me, I'm like, well, I'm going to go listen to this guy talk because, you know, what does he know? And so I, I'm recommending that. Uh, I think masterclass is pretty cool. I think there's a lot of great stuff on YouTube in general, but sometimes getting, spending four hours in this case with somebody who really knows their craft. I thought the writing advice was really good. It was spot on and he had some insights and he was able to sort of kind of draw circles around things, which I thought was really well done. Uh, he also talked about something which is kind of interesting, which I always wondered when you get to his level, when your books, you know, I've sold over a million books. He has books that sold, he has individual books that sold over a million copies. Right. And, when you're at that level, when you're a James Patterson or a Stephen King, I always thought like the publisher gives you like 15% of the cover price or whatever. I'm like, does that, does that apply to them? Like what happens to them? And he described basically what he did once he was this huge, he had the hard, largest advance ever, $2 million advance for his first book. But he said that once he proved he had a track record of sales, again, proved he had a track record of sales, he went to the publisher and is like, all right, I want you to lay down what all your costs are, what it costs you to edit, all this, all these sorts of things, et cetera, dot, 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 dot. And we're going to draw that number down. Okay. And then we're going to take the total pie and we're going to deduct that from it. And then we're going to split it. And half so Eddie, he <laughs> half <yeah>. Eddie. Wow. <laughs> and so wow. To, the editor, because the, the publisher's like, yeah, you guys maybe spend a couple hundred thousand dollars and maybe you're going to spend this much on promotions. So it's fine. Put that down. I want, you know, I want you to take that, you know, we'll take that out of the total amount, then I want to keep half of this. And so that's insane. You got to wonder and that's when, a whole when, when that's at the high end, you know, that that, that is that is an yeah. interesting an interesting story for for publishing. Well, that's cause... that's a bad music contract. <laughs> that's how good that's how like it sits. Like that's how a like recouping like album deal would be. Uh, and those are well. I he's an attorney. I'm sure there's sure. A, enough, you know, accountability in there. No, 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 say, no, 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 no. I, I, no. I think, I think that's that Bryce is saying that for the publisher, that's that's a that. Oh that, yeah, yeah. That that's that yeah. that is that is a very talent friendly deal. Yes, that yeah. is that is a a you know especially yeah. when you know that there is going to be X amount of sales to say no, you're I'm not going to let you do any funny accounting. Uh, 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 we're going to we're say what your budget is to process stuff. And then let's split it down the middle past that. And to have that, and like Patterson, James Patterson and Stephen King, they've got that kind of weight too, which I thought was oh, like, yeah. I'm sure J.K. Rowling. That's a thing too, because you look at like, oh, well, you know, they're making 15, they're making $3 per book, da, 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 da. And it's a million, like, well, no, actually, Andrew, like, you know, they could be making double or triple depending, you know, it's a, then when you get into digital, when you get into that, that's one of the things that was really the screwiest things ever is like, I have early ebook contracts with other publishers where I was getting a fraction of that purchase price. And I'm like, your costs are nothing. Your costs, yeah. you don't have to print, you don't have to warehouse, you don't have to do anything. This sort of seemed to me like a little bit egregious because it was just like, they were just really well, screwing and, over and authors in my opinion. For those mega stars, I mean, the alternative, if, if the publisher doesn't want to take the deal, nowadays it's not, it's, it's, it's not a discredit to just launch your own imprint where it's like- nah, I, you, yeah, you could, but you just go find another publisher. You just, you just, you would just take that deal to another publisher, not have to hire, not have to, you know, put on a staff and do that. Because you could find another. There, there are a lot of publishers that uh, I would see. I would see. Yeah, it would seem the like there's a writer's like, market. Because if you're like, okay, I need to have the person that talks to the person at Barnes and Noble to make sure they're going to do a five hundred thousand buy and it's get there. It is. You, you're right, Brian. You could, but it's like for that level, you're, like, you're just. Like I, I made my decision Amazon publishing because like I'm eBooks. Like I don't, you're not going to see my books in a, a bookstore or a hardcover. It's not going to happen um, because it's just, I knew where my audience was. But if I was at the level of James Patterson and I wanted all that, then. Yeah. Do you feel like the masterclass touched on much of this stuff? Well, yeah, that was where David Baldacci flat out said, this is my deal I made of my public. I'm like, oh, yeah. this is really cool. This isn't, this is like a, you know, a, very, and I don't know how helpful it would be to anybody watching that class because 
first sell as many books as David Baldacci. <laughs> yeah. You know? But it's good to know. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's good it's, advice. It's, it's good yeah. to begin with the ending in mind, you know, to to know what you to to know what if your ask is well that would be appropriate for Stephen King or David Baldacci but maybe not appropriate for so, your first novel yeah and somebody uh, Princess Delirium pointed out fairly so to Brian's point Brandon Sanderson went straight to Kickstarter um, I would say that ninety percent of Brandon Sanderson's audience knows what Kickstarter is yeah where uh, Patterson or Baldacci maybe they, not. they wouldn't know what that was. Yeah, and I did well there, but that Sanderson was one. Sanderson is an exceptional writer, exceptionally high output. Is at the conventions, is a super engaged guy who's very active, and engaged with his audience. People have met him, people know him, whatever. He 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 checked off every single thing you would need to do to to make something successful. And for those of you who don't know, Brandon Sanderson did something like a forty million dollar Kickstarter, forty one for his book series. Or something? It was it was bonkers. No yeah, and, autographs. <laughs> no yeah, autographs. Yeah. And, and understandably Hero. so. And what a I, what a Chad. <laughs> I I was just in awe because I just I just like it's not something I would ever be able to do. I but I love the fact that I live in a world where somebody who's that talented, that hardworking, and gets it is able to do a forty one million dollar Kickstarter. Wow. Yeah, and we'll, see, and we'll see, right? Because they're shipping next year, so we're we're close to uh, people actually getting their uh, getting their books without yeah. autographs. <laughs> yeah. Love him, I love him so much. Yeah, gentlemen, Ooh. it's been weird. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, no, Princess Delirium. Uh, no, your point, cool. absolutely. Like, and it was it was a fair point to say that he was able to go around. Uh, the machinery. And I, I think it, it's something that worked really well for him, harder for, uh, like I said, a, a more traditional author that's audience is less engaged, but it's absolutely a great point. Or, or uh, uh, um, authors with uh, uh, an audience of a certain demographic uh, that begins to become more of an uphill climb. Yeah. Yep. Right, I, I love like... An... Oh. Uh, no, go ahead, Andrew. No, go ahead. No, no, you're good. <laughs> no, I was just gonna make a small point. It was just like my books come out; they're also on Kindle Unlimited. So people who pay like X ten bucks a month or whatever who get that, they can read for free. I get emails from people who like are retirees and say they're on fixed incomes who thank me for that, and that makes me feel good because it's like, oh, cool. This is a system where I don't feel like the cool thing about being like a YouTuber or a Twitch person or like a wee podcaster, you get to give it away, and then yeah. you try to recapture some profit later on. But the price of access is nothing. And I love that with books. I love the idea that anybody can get into it because, you know, 10 bucks a month, 10 bucks or 10 bucks to spend on a book can sometimes be a lot. And, you know, it, it's, it's, and somebody's got a lot of other competing things. So, yeah. All right. We're going to take a minute and uh, come back for some after things. I got a good thing for, I got a good topic for. Oh, after good. Today. You got a good after? Yeah. I got a good after things today. You got a good after for that? BRB. Thing. Yeah, but uh, we're going to take a minute and uh, give everyone a chance to get a break. Hi, Justin. Yo. My goodness, has it been another 24 hours? No, it's 48 hours since I last saw you. When we saw it, we were Saturday. We were watching college football. Yeah. So it's, yeah, not 48. Not 48. Uh, how's it going? Dude, you know, living what were you doing? the dream. What were, you, what were you up to yesterday? Did you do, did you have a quiet day yesterday after the boat, or did you no, live it up? It, well, I mean, not really living it up. I watched a lot of football. I had I had red zone on and I was watching football and uh, oh yes yeah. yeah what was that uh, we watched uh what do we watch oh we're 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 we're, we're getting through Moon Knight uh, oh yeah and I gotta say I mean so far this might totally fall off a cliff but like I think we're three episodes in and uh, I don't know we kind of like it yeah kind of we're kind of having fun with Moon Knight it's it's not uh, it is it is uh, I think of it. Uh, I, I, I don't want to go too far into it because I know that it 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 hit a, a patch where people were not in <laughs> love with it. Um, but I think if you're you're said you're what halfway through, three episodes in. I don't know how long this. Yeah, that's about is. halfway. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Then then keep going, man. Oh, we will. Yeah. Oh, we will. You're gonna, you're gonna have. Yeah, to I mean, I guess it, like the, the 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 thing is, Oscar Isaac. It obviously is a director who wants to do a, um wants to do a, a very visually 
uh, uh, enticing story. Mm. Oscar Isaac is a movie star, right? So he is giving a movie star's performance. Uh, I can, you know, obviously there are elements in any kind of, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a story in which one actor plays multiple characters is always going to invite uh, a little bit of scrutiny. Well, it's just, you know, any <laughs> any actor, if you ask anybody, right, in the world, you need to play four different characters. Uh, it's probably going to involve voices. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it may or may not involve voices that are, you know, kind of. Different. Should be different. Should be discernible. They should be. They should sound different. And so it's like. I can certainly tell where Oscar Isaac really wants to do his British accent. You know, <laughs> you know, he really wants to do that, and and uh, uh, and and that is an element of like, okay, that's the cost of Oscar Isaac doing a direct to streaming Marvel thing. Is you're gonna have to let him make choices that you probably wouldn't to other talent. Sure. Um, but so far, I don't know. I'm I'm, I'm having uh, I'm having a good time with it. Nice. Uh, yeah, I think uh, yeah. If you're this far in, you're gonna you're gonna like the rest of it. So then we'll do Miss Marvel. Although I will say this: Miss Marvel's supposed to be good. House of the Dragon. Uh, uh, I'm only now starting to lose my patience with it. Oh, we're, uh, oh, oh, oh. Uh oh. I think it changed your audio input, Andrew. We'll we'll have you muted until we see you again. Um, Here, I'll use. The yeah, go for it. Uh, hello everybody. We'll do some after things here in just another minute. Ba, 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 ba. Were you guys talking about the uh, Game of Thrones thing? Uh, Justin was about to, but I actually have not. I haven't seen it in a couple of weeks now. Yeah. Um, but uh, but I liked what I saw. I like what I saw. Are you are you interested in it? Uh, what, what do you I, need to, I, to get into? I I, I I think I need the Westworld uh experience. Mm -hmm. I I. I want to have everything spoiled and then watch it all in one day. Mm. What do you talk about? Uh, we did an experiment, uh, uh, the new Game of Thrones thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, for Westworld, um, like uh, season after season, I was so frustrated uh, about what seemed like a slow, plodding, laborious everything that this year we tried something different, which was for spoiler in time, I would just listen to Tom and Bryce talk about it and I would ask questions and they would tell me the story as if we're sitting around a campfire and then all in one day I watched the entire season and I loved it. Which I don't know that I would have loved it if I was watching it week after week because I, I didn't love the previous ones that way. Sign back into Skype. What's up? Oh, hello. Uh, Pardon me. I have to sign back into Skype. Oh, okay. Yeah. Which means find a password that. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Says he's running out of patience with the the rings of power. He might Bryce slice it. Ooh, oh I my god! Wait, has has anybody amongst our crew watched Rings of Power? Mm -mm. No. Should we Bryce I've, slice it? I haven't seen the latest. I haven't seen the last episode. I, I have you watched? So you've watched some of it? Because I've watched none of it, and I'm curious. Yeah. How, uh, where, what's your What's your take? Should we watch it? Yep. Um, Bryce, can you call me? Um, uh, yeah. I. I. Stinko Malinko. Um. So far. No, I. I don't. I don't hate it, <laughs> but I'm not going to tell the people. No, no, I've enjoyed it so far. I've enjoyed it. There are things that kind of get to me a little bit, but I'm not going to tell the people that hate it or have reasons to hate it. They're wrong. I'm not yeah. going to say like, oh, well, you guys, you nerds just got to give up. I'm like, no, like it's, it's, you know, like I didn't see the latest episode and there's something that like, you know, an elf trade dispute or something like this. I think, and I'm like, I, think I saw that clip on, <laughs> on Twitter. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm like, yeah, I haven't seen this episode yet. I'm like, there's there is a danger. The Tolkien in C.S. Lewis, there is a deeply rooted allegory in what they're writing about. <laughs> um, 
deeply rooted and it is there it is a theme about rebirth and honesty and forgiveness and a certain view of the world that maybe some of it's antiquated or whatever but god it makes for wonderful storytelling so i you know my i've made no secret how frustrated i was with foundation because foundation Yes, you need to adapt, you need to change. Peter Jackson had to adapt and change Lord of the Rings to fit in the time period. It'd take 40 years and put in three years and four. Totally, totally get that. Foundation was, eh, I'm going to take out this complex idea because I don't think people are going to get it. And I'm going to put in my clone emperors, whatever. And you're like, why? Cool. Why did you take that? Why did you take that thing if you weren't going to use it? And that was that was exactly my same thing with Watchmen, where it's like, why? You have it. Tell this story. This story exists. Like, and it's cool. You can tell another story if you want to tell another story, but that couldn't have been done in a thing that wasn't this cool story. I, yeah, and Foundation, like, you get like five episodes in and you get actually a meeting of the Foundation talking about for quickly, we'll just get through this business and then we'll get back to like the space. You know, like, there's an effing space elevator and clone emperors and stuff. And I'm like, like, you know, Isaac Asimov is one of the greatest writers of all time in sci-fi, but I'm going to throw out what he did. And I'm going to put in my own ideas. It's, you know, how hard can it be? Because you got to. Otherwise, how will people yeah. know that I worked on it? It's like, I, I describe it. It's like, you know, this James Bond thing, does he need to be a spy? But- Why isn't he a art influencer? Why well, is he it works for Universal Imports? What about that guy? Why I know more isn't about that James guy. Bond a van lifer? <laughs> Why is it James yeah. Bond someone's muse? <laughs> yeah. gonna... All right. Uh, you guys want to do some after things? Yes. Yep. Ready. Yes. Okay. Uh, then, Andrew, I'll count you in for after things. In three, two, Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hello. And Justin Robert Young. Yo, yo, yo. Man, I wish somebody here had a topic. I got a topic, got a topic for us. Oh, my God, Bryce. Hello. I've, uh, I've talked a lot. Somebody pull on their weight. <laughs> somebody pull on their weight. Pull on my right weight, now. Please. Pull on my weight. I've talked a lot about the Things app on uh on on after things the um the to do app that is really really uh intuitive uh kind of easy to use a lot of drag and drop stuff um i i really dig it because it's very easy to use because i can just just pick it up pick things, pick up an item and move it move it up and down yeah things uh, uh very much from the kind of getting things done boom of the late aughts uh that has has only been i think uh, uh, refined in the mobile uh, uh, the 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 iPhone, Android, smartphone era. Yeah, and for 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 a to do app, it has everything you would want from it: tags and lists and projects, bundles, uh, all, all sorts of stuff. Snoozes. Uh, you can set a, alerts and snoozes. Absolutely. Uh, recurring, very complicated and and in depth recurring rules you can set for for events. But I I've been having a little bit of trouble with it lately, um, and so I I I. I went and I I ended up finding another app that does oh no calendar and to do stuff. You strayed. I'm straying. You a little stray. Bit. Oh, you. Oh, I'm trying it. I'm straying. Just what a, a little cad with a <laughs> uh, with an app called Structured. Uh, it's called Structured. It's another iPhone, iPad, Mac OS app. Um, and the difference with Structured is that. Uh, you do still have tasks, and you 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 know set when you'd like to do them and how long they'll take, and you can you can label them with colors. Um, but as you do so, you are also filling out your calendar. You either put stuff stuff in your inbox where there's it can be whenever, or you say it's going to be at this time. And so you're building a to do list that is designed to be your day uh, planner. Does it just like randomly assign times? No, you tell it. You you, you se- tell it. You tell it. Hey, this is going to be five minutes. It's going to be just. I just need to know when this. It's going to take one minute, so I need to know when it happens. Um, and I am. I am. Uh, I'm kind of only at the start of it. I only got it a few days ago with uh, uh, with the new iPhone update because they've got a lock screen widget and they were in a in the App Store thing. 
But um, uh, but but I'm I'm gonna try that out to see how that works in terms of uh, uh, putting putting stuff down, getting getting stuff done. You know, getting... is is the only significant difference that it integrates with calendars? Uh, the the big difference between it and things is. Uh, is, is that it is always in a calendar uh, view. So with with the Things app, you can just have stuff um, that is for today or for tomorrow um, or just is not dated at all. It just, hey, this is stuff for the vacation. Very list-based. List yeah, where, this, where, where the structured app is time calendar-based um, because normally I don't do a lot of calendar calendaring i i i've liked things because i could just move stuff around and grab it and and take what i need but um you know uh, uh change changing up uh, uh uh things a little bit and, and and trying to see how that works i don't know do do y'all have uh a structure for uh, your i am day? i am very much a day structure person uh uh at i'm, I'm good with it Lately, but uh, when I was at my my most structured during the lockdown, uh, that was the first thing I would do every morning is look at my, I would write out what is on my Google Calendar on my whiteboard just so I could familiarize myself with what my day was going to be. There was not going to be a lot of surprises. That's where I would often find that I had booked a thing that I forgot that I had booked. And so it it, it would avoid me being in the embarrassing situations where I'm like, Oh crap, crap, crap. Sorry. I, I forgot about a thing. Uh, but yeah, I, I think between things and this, I would probably be far more on the structured train of let me find a place for which I can constantly be throwing, uh, things on a calendar as opposed to a pile of things I need to do. Yeah. Uh, I, I've drifted towards, uh, uh, I, I took a stack of note cards, super thick, uh, because I was taking notes for the class, and then uh, we did the class, and so I don't pay attention to those note cards, mm -hmm. but I still have the note cards by my desk, and so kind of the ritual is I sit down, first thing I do is open up calendar, figure out, like, is there anything prearranged at a specific time, uh, and, I, you know, I note those, and then I look down at sort of you know, the stray thoughts of, I gotta, I gotta do, I gotta get around to, this is on my plate or whatever. And, uh, and then oftentimes I'll, depending on, you know, how fiery I'm feeling, I'll either start with the lowest hanging fruit because it feels good to scratch things off the list or, or, or because it's early enough and I'm on fire, it's like, let me tackle this challenging thing that I, that's been dodging me. Mm. But I, I rather dig the complete separation of my digital structured calendar from the physical straight thoughts, because there's something about physically writing it down that feels more like this responsibility is extracted from my brain. It no longer requires my attention. Uh, and, and, and it's because it takes longer to do and because it sits in my visual field. Um, but uh, I, I'll, I'll be curious, I, I, I don't know if I'll give this a try, but I, I'd be curious to know if this gives me the same sense of relief yeah. that, that that release that i get from physically writing down like this is now out of my brain and on my list of to do's which is why i liked things because it's all everything and every screen you're on is designed for you to write a thing very quickly it's a lot of intuitive that's the thing that kind of structure the structured app is pretty weak on right now is it's one guy but it's still a little new um so there are some weird things like when I'll start a task. When I'll start to create a task, uh, it asks you what time you want your task to be. Well, if you don't remember what time you wanted it to be at, you have to close the window and you have to look at it. Oh, uh, yeah. Back up. So little things like that. But it's also the little things that make it feel totally different, right? Like you have uh, on on structured here, I, I, uh, you, you might be able to help. You set icons. You can have an icon for your task. And so... As you're going through your day, you are just seeing, oh, the, uh, uh, oh, yep, I got uh, the shopping cart at shopping time. So you can, you get a bit of a, at a glance. So does this sync with Google Calendar? Uh, it does. It, it, you, it can sync with your uh, calendars and with your reminders app, the stock reminders app. Um, Bryce, I think you might have talked me into it. And, and hey, five, last bit, this is all free promo for whatever. Uh, uh, it is script. There is a subscription 
plan, but the free app it's cheap. It, it is a tree. It's a cheap subscription. It's like a dollar fifty for monthly, uh, and like thirty bucks for lifetime. Um, uh, but the pro plan, that's where you get uh, recurring events. Uh, that's where you get uh, more custom alerts, push notifications, reminders, and things. But the but the free app even still has a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff in there. Because I did that, the I downloaded it for free and just built one day, and tried it out, and uh, and now I got now I'm trying it out for a month. So we'll see. I am I'm fascinated by this because, like you know, you ask like what kind of planning or structure do I do, and uh, <laughs> I'm horrible. And yeah. like 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 my let me tell you how I plan. Night before I pull up my calendar which I now have to use because a job and people expect <laughs> you to do work <laughs> and, uh, is like two days away from one year as a full time or at opening eye. And, uh, um, and also sometimes to find, Hey, there's a surprise meeting at 8 AM that somebody put on your, as you're like at 3 AM watching, you know, reruns or something and like, Oh, better uh, adjust that alarm clock. But anyhow, um, I, that's my planning is I literally look at, what do I have? And I'll pay attention to like, I've got an ongoing project that I paid attention to this week to sort of see when do I have, you know, certain meetings to do certain stuff. But um, I spend a lot of my time, like people go like, how does long, you know, takes me 10 days to write a book, but it takes me months of procrastination and stressing out. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that if I break up those tasks into smaller tasks and get them done in advance, you know, I'm very good about like, if somebody says, oh, we need you to fill this thing out. I'm like, I'm just going to start it now so I get most of it done because I don't want to have to worry about it and panic. And then I end up getting stuff done and people are like, oh, you're very efficient. I'm like, no, I'm like super lazy. I just can keep in mind that future Andrew is equally lazy. Yeah. Well, so I'm fascinated by this. How, I, I would be curious how uh, the three of you guys handle uh, the driving remembering problem. Where it's like you 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 have a thought and you and realize two, you have a task. Stay within the speed and limit. And you need to, you are certain that by the time you get home, it'll be gone to the ether unless you do something. What is that something that you guys do? Oh, I I use the Note app all the time. I will literally write, Note! And then dot, dot, dot. I do not have a forgetting problem that I'm aware of, unless mm. I have a really huge forgetting problem <laughs> that allows me <laughs> to think that I don't have a forgetting problem. But I am, I use Apple Notes excessively to note stuff, to keep track of things like that. And so uh, very good, you know, the, the biggest problem for me is like sometimes something doesn't get done. And this is whether it's writing or anything else is because it's unresolved because you don't actually know the work. And you think like, oh, I got to work this thing. And the thing that's really stressing you out is the uncertainty. Like yes. markets don't like uncertainty. Political structures don't like uncertainty. And our brain does not like uncertainty. So if, yeah, if you're sitting there going, I got to do X, but you don't really know what the work to get X done means. We'll stress out and not get it done. I think that that was the biggest thing. The most productive I have been was after realizing that uh, uh, step one, list things you want to do. Step two, understand what those things are. And this was the crucial one. Step three, when you don't know how to do it, then learn how to reduce it to the smallest possible task. Like, like there is no shame in taking something that you want to do bigger uh, uh, and saying, oh, I don't know how to do that. And so I'm procrastinating, not because I don't want to do it. I desperately want to do it. I'm procrastinating because I don't know exactly what that means. And I might be ashamed that I'm not, uh, uh, that I don't exactly know what it means. But I do know that I could do one thing, even if that one thing is watch a YouTube video about how to do blank. Uh, right. Well, well uh, I tell to, you? To, to the question, uh, when you have that thought and you're behind the wheel, what do you okay, do? Yeah. So, so driving specifically, uh, uh, I would say, you know, uh, especially because normally I'm listening to a podcast or I have my phone plugged in. Uh, I'll just use the steering wheel like a uh, uh, Siri thing and uh -huh. just set a reminder when I'm at home. Remind me when you get blank. home. Yeah. yeah. And so that, it'll use the location stuff. That, 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 that's one that I lean on heavily, both, both for when I get home or when I leave here. Yeah. Uh, and, and 
it's it's really wild uh, because I have a tendency to never erase them. So it's like I'll be driving past a random Chinese food place and it'll just say, don't forget to go to Goodwill. I know. Yeah. <laughs> no, I do. I do have a hard time deleting like because I think I'll delete it. And the next time I'll get home and it's like, like, like uh, remember to take out the trash. And it's like, I did it yesterday. Stop yelling at me. Well, see, you got to do it. Can in, I tell you? I do it in my things app and then I check it off. Okay. I mean, All you're right. driving the future, man. Was, when I'm done. Go ahead. Man. Oh, this time delay. Oh, <laughs> it's huge, huge lag. Oh, uh, um, would, uh, why don't you hang up and disconnect? Why, why don't we just... Uh... Why don't you hang up and disconnect, Bryce? Okay. Sorry. That was... No, what should I do? <laughs> uh, uh, just uh, hit uh, uh, disconnect and reconnect for me on uh, on the Opal screen. We, I, no, I noticed we, we were getting some lag in Skype, too, so I don't, I don't know what was up with that. Or delay. All right. All right. Can you hear How's us? How's this? Yep. All right. Yep. Cool. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like scratch my face, and I'd sit down and grab a drink of water, and I'd look back up, and I'm scratching my face. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, uh, um, I am, I am, I would like to do a whole episode on this, and I may kind of do, like, um, so... Uh, full disclosure, I work for a company called OpenAI, and uh, we have a system called GPT-3, and it, we've got a couple different versions of it now. We've got one that's like trained for like answering specific questions and doing stuff, which anybody can get access to this now. It's open list. Uh, it has become such a big part of my productivity, and sometimes it can be something as simple as like, oh, I have to get all my stuff into QuickBooks. What's an easy way to get this done? You ask oh, it, geez. and it tells you? Yes. Whoa. Huh. That's uh, like Wait. open open the app. Go to the window. Click new taxes. Well, it'll be like it might say like, oh, first gather all your documents together, or do this or that. But if you said, hey, I wanted to write a book, you know, how should I outline it, or what should I plan? It'll tell you. You know, it's really good at this sort of thing. Like if you said, if I wanted to build a podcast studio, what would be, you start podcasting, what can I do? A lot of it's basic stuff, but it's really, you can use it. I do, I do a lot of like, hey, what's the easiest way to do this? And then we have our code models, which if I'm doing something with code, I'm like, hey, how can I do this in code? Or what can I do? Write, write an application for me to do blank and stuff. So you're going to see more and more of this out there. People start using AI to start doing kind of more complex stuff and like, even even what the the current GPT three models capable of is really way more than people realize. Because we did an update to it, and that's when I did that whole blog post about all the uh, writing the uh, games and stuff with it. And so, if you just say if you set a task like you know, uh, look, you know, I say I'm writing like if I, I have to write a book. What should I do to prepare an outline? You know, it'll give you some basic, sometimes basic stuff, but like sometimes you're like, oh yeah, that's a really good point. Hmm. And uh, and and how how accessible is the G the GPT technology versus something like Dolly, which has a large computational uh, uh, demand? Well, I mean, it's they're both using computers, but like I just I just used the the playground interface, and I said I have to write a book about what I should do to prepare, and I have to write a book. What should I do to prepare an outline? One, before you start writing a book, you need to prepare and outline your ideas to help organize your thoughts. Two, start by brainstorming ideas for your book. Write down anything that comes to mind, no matter how silly or small. Three, once you have ideas, start narrowing them down. Which idea is the most interesting? What makes some sense? Once you have ideas, start outlining what will happen in each chapter. What are the main points you want to make? As you outline your book, keep in mind the overall structure. How will beginning and beginning will fit together? You know, and then it, it could be like, you know, you know, there's a, it's just, yeah. You know, you can ask questions like, how can I market this? How can I do this for brainstorming and stuff? You know, um, it's just a lot of that. You can just start a little dialogue and say, okay, now I need to do this. What should I do after that? Yeah. Wow. Uh, I mean, I guess a, that's the dream, right? Computer, tell me how to build a tree house. And then eventually, computer, build my tree house. Yes, well, yeah. I will build your tree house. Thank you, tree house bot. Meep, bop, bop, meep, meep. <laughs> Treehouse complete. Ah, uh, this is truly the future of 2002. I've become yeah. too powerful. Oh, Back no. to my home world. You can, oh, no. You can, you could give it like a summary of it and say, write a sales letter for this. Write, help me write a pitch email to sell this book. 
here's this like I could do. Let me try this in real time. I'm looking forward to this app. <laughs> yeah, I'm on it. I'm on it. I have not set anything up. I want to actually go through their uh, their little intro uh, when when we're not also doing a show. But uh, uh, I'm I'm actually really into it because that's something that I feel like my my Google Calendar game has gotten a little creaky. There's been a few things that I do like every day that I haven't thought to put in there, and so like uh, uh, I would I, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I'm 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 excited. Yeah, it's uh, structured. Yeah, uh, got a free, got a good free plan. I'm gonna stick to my note cards. I'm, it, I'm, a, I'm. It, like, you're getting note cards. Thick, by the way, uh, like literal, li- like I'm almost an inch thick, just pile of note cards. And when I put them all together and go through them, uh, same thought, written like seven times. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge believer in physical tactile stuff, and in fact, the what thing that I'm looking forward to most with this app is having an interface where. Uh, I'll, I'll always list out my day and then I'll list out my to do's that I would like to get done. Uh, and I, I, I think having a better place where I can now not only look at my calendar for stuff that I need to do, but also then to do's, uh, uh, would be, would be great. And, uh, uh, having it in one place would be great. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, it's, uh, uh it's, it's, yeah. So we'll see. I, I'm interested, especially not just the structured app, but also, if there's still a place to use the things app, because it was expensive to buy the things app, it's that, that. that's why I never got into those those getting things done apps. Is that it was like like hey, uh, it's like getting into a religion or like something. It was like like you need to spend all of your time thinking about this process about thinking, and also for the privilege to so we know you're serious. Give us two hundred dollars, and it's like whoa, hold well on. Yeah, oh. I I'm curious to see how long if it sticks or works, because I am desperately, desperately needing something to organize my life. I need something to help me figure this stuff out because um, I I live through so much stress, so many things I have to do. And working with a job and everything else like this, there's all that other anxiety that gets added on top of stuff and being able to sort of lay out things in a line and say, okay, this is what I need to do now. This is what I have to do next. This is next uh, would be super helpful. Uh I don't, I don't really have any other picks outside of to just double down on life's work, uh, that, that, that David Milch memoir. Um, it was, it was very powerful to me. Yeah, that, that was, uh, mentioned in, we talked about in weird things. Um, and anytime somebody with that kind of deep information, oh, yeah. you know, that's just, oh. You learn so much from that. In 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 a world where kind of genius is sort of thrown around, you know, there's there's always you know another genius kind of rolling around through through the world of television writing. Uh, Milch is, I think, you know, one of one of those for which you always know his writing. And uh, boy, has he done his damnedest to to destroy his own career. <laughs> uh, uh, and and uh, he has not been successful. Yeah. Well. Yeah. That is. I feel like an underachiever because I think of like every, I, I don't have any addictions as far as I know of. I hadn't had to deal with those demons, having to deal with anything like this. And I feel like I'm barely getting by. And then I see some like, yeah, I did heroin. I got off that. I did this. And yeah, I produced like some epic best selling TV series of all time and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, oh, you know, yeah. okay. Um, that's what real talent is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a, there was one, um, uh, clip where he's talking about the end of Deadwood and he says, uh, uh, you know, as unfortunate as the abrupt ending was, he said, uh, only a child thinks these things can go on forever and only a child would think you can't start again. And, and it was just, uh, 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 it was so earnest, honest, and, and, and powerful. Uh, my pick is House of the Dragon. Hey, I still like it, but boy, are they setting up a thing. Boy, do I want that inciting incident to happen. Boy, did I thought it was going to happen. Well, still it waiting. is. Still it waiting. Is. They, they set up what the thing is about. The succession. Yep. So, oh, yep. Yep. Oh. Just that. Will they hey, or won't they? Hey, just kind of hanging out. Although, a uh, uh, shout out to all the, the uh, this, there's a big time jump, I guess, between the episode that aired on Sunday and the next one. Whoa. Uh, Sorry. I got wow. a spam call. Well, at least you Including... said it to the fullest volume. 
please, such, if spam such, calls, alert me immediately. Such, <laughs> Why such can't I get time, anything done? <laughs> such a huge time jump. There's actually a new character playing the character. Exactly. Yeah. Just, uh, the, the two actresses that I think have really carried the the, the show will not be on the show anymore because <laughs> there's two new actresses that are that are uh, 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 playing those characters time jumped. So we will uh, we will see. But that's that's a heavy burden. I, I'm curious to see how they handle it. Yeah. I've enjoyed it. The I, you know, the problem. What made Game of Thrones great was scale. What made Game of Thrones problematic later seasons was scale. Yeah. So uh, I would say that if anything, maybe it's too small. And also, like, I kind of feel like I don't really have a Jon Snow or a Tyrion. I don't really have a character that I'm like. There really, is my there really isn't, and that's the one thing that I think. I was excited about at the beginning because there was this like side war that was happening and I was like, oh, cool. That's a thing that the characters are focusing on. And so they're always going to be talking about that while they're dealing with this stuff on the side. And then that kind of got wrapped up. And now it's like, no, all we're talking about is this thing. We're just going to talk about I think, this thing the entire time. I think, I think the choice they made was the idea that in in the in Game of Thrones people would go from light to dark or dark to light that yeah. would be the thing here everybody's light and dark and so even even Damien you yeah. know is a monster but not not like a Jamie Lannister pure sociopath at the beginning he's 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 a guy that is in a powerful man who uses it and is more complex and I think that's sort of thing. Everybody, the king isn't a complete incompetent. He actually makes some smart decisions and stuff, and you agree with why he does things. And so I think that's I think that's kind of a good point about it. They tried to do, but it does make you kind of go like you know like oh this this guy with his limp showed up. Is he going to be our Tyrion? No, he's just another power seeker. You know, like yeah, uh, uh, I'm 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 reserving all all I will say is uh, uh, I'm this was the first time that I was like okay, let's get to the get to the thing kind of looking for yeah. the thing to happen so uh my pick uh fire ship which is one of my favorite websites or excuse me uh actually this website is but it's also a youtube channel for like all sorts of stuff on coding and developing they just launched uh um fire ship uh, a new channel uh basically like for more extended coding stuff so I forget the title of it, but uh, I, there's two channels now. So they have another channel. So I like watching all of the stuff. It's really good. Cool. Oh, uh, Bryce, did you have anything? No. Oh, Just okay. the app. And we're all on. We're going to be yeah, structured. I, I downloaded it too. Structured to boys. I mean, the next episode. Chopping down trees. Chopping down trees. Chopping down trees. Chop, 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 chop. Chopping down trees. Gentlemen, it's been after. Hell yeah. Yep, it's been after in this mother, mother, hell yeah. All righty, everybody. We are going to go offline. Thank you, everybody, mother, for joining mother, us. Hell yeah. After things, after things. Makes you go dance on strings. Eat, eat some wings. <laughs> eat some wings. They're, 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 they're expensive now. Expensive things. Wait, did, did, the, did the wing rebellion? No, it's down now. Oh, no, okay. more, no more market price chicken wings. <laughs> market price chicken wings slayed me. Yeah. No, they're back. They're back to norm. All right, everybody. We're going to go offline, and uh, we'll be back in a few hours for Cord Killers. Coming up. So. Pew, pew, pew. Yo, yo. Brandis, we'll see you then. Just children, heaven was a dreamer